Okay. So now the attendees can join, start joining us. A very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. And if you have joined us from the UK and Europe, good morning to you. Welcome to a virtual conference on India's aerospace industry and its potential. The conference is organized by Meshmix Media and is powered by Supply Point. I thank you and I thank all the attendees in particular for registering for this webinar. I appreciate your time and presence for this discussion that promises to be engaging and full of insights. I'm Anand Pandey, DMI's editor and your session moderator. And I feel immensely honored to tell you that we are joined by three senior, very experienced and learned professionals of the aerospace and supply chain industry. We have Mr. Srinivasan Balasubramanian, Chief Executive Officer, IAMPL, a joint venture between HAL and Rolls-Royce. We have Mr. Surendra M. Vaidya, Executive Vice President and Business Head, Godrich Aerospace. We have Mr. Mark Pierce, President of Supply Point. I will ask our esteemed panelists to tell us a bit more about themselves and their work but before that, let me quickly tell you the flow of the event. After our uh, quick round of introduction, Mr. Mark Pierce will share with us a presentation that has some excellent facts and figures about the industry and supply point, following which we'll have a discussion on the subject in question that is how India's aerospace industry can realize its true potential. Let me begin with the, the round of introduction with Sini Sini, tell us more about yourself and your work. Thank you, Anand. I am, it's my pleasure to be part of this forward panel. I am Srinivasan, Chief Executive Officer of International Aerospace Manufacturing Private Limited, called as IAMPL in short, manufacturing high precision machined components and special processed parts for the highly technologically advanced aerospace engines for both civil and defense markets. IAMPL is very unique that the facility is managed with uh, an integrated GE Proficy system that's it's digitally managed. And we are also one of the kind of uh, facility with an integrated machining and special process capabilities under one roof. We support close to 160 parts from India to worldwide supporting all the Rolls-Royce engines that are flying today. That's about me. Thank you, Anand. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sini. Mr. Vaidya? Yeah, greetings to all the participants and my co-panelists. Uh, my name is SM Vaidya. I head the Godrej Aerospace. You all know that Godrej and Boyce is more than 120 years old company in India starting from uh, the consumer products. We also have some specialized divisions like the aerospace into nuclear and defense and uh, many other sectors. So I head uh, this Godrej Aerospace. Uh, we started working with Indian Space Program in 1985 and then 89 we entered into the defense and 2010 onwards we are into civil aviation with the global uh, OEMs. And currently, uh, we have a major participation into uh, all the launch vehicles and satellites with the Indian Space Program, all the missiles and the helicopters and the fighters, which India produces uh, with HAL as the integrator or BDL as the integrator. And we also supply a lot of parts to uh, Europe and uh, UK and the uh, US. So I think uh, this should be good enough for me to at having give my thoughts in this uh, particular webinar. Thank you, uh, Anand, for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. Vaidya. Over to you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. And uh, again, like uh, my two colleagues, I'm uh, very pleased to be part of this, this forum today. Um, I, I'll give a bit of a background about Supply Point in a moment. I've got a couple of slides to, to share on that. But um, my background is, uh, running Supply Point, and we are an intelligent inventory solutions business around the world. And we've partnered with aerospace companies uh, across the world, the US, um, uh, Europe, Asia, uh, India, and particularly in China. And uh, we've got a lot of experience of supporting our customers and partners in, in terms of improving their businesses. 
uh, making a difference in managing inventories and stocks and assets around the world. And um, I hope to bring a little bit of input into this. Uh, my two esteemed colleagues will have much more direct uh, understanding of the aerospace market, but I'm, I, I see it from a very different aspect, from a perspective of a supplier um, and a supporter of businesses trying to deliver value in supply chains and making things more efficient. Thank you, Mark. Now we, uh, we await the presentation that you have to share with us. So it's uh, just a, a, a few slides, just to expand a bit about, about uh, what uh, we as supply points um, uh, will do as a business. And uh, you know, I'm very pleased that we've been around with a number of businesses uh, for over 20 years. And uh, we have a very supportive uh, parent company based out of America who are completely focused on investment and how to drive value and growth to customers and partners around the world. And uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary in, in 2018. And where we are today is we are operating out of nine locations uh, across, uh, across the world. Uh, we have production of our solutions and development of our software uh, in three specific locations in the US, in Europe, and in China. And uh, around the world, there's 200 people within our business and four in India, which is not many, but it's um, so far it's enough for us as we as we support and, and, and watch the, the Indian market grow and develop. We're seeing demand for our solutions and technological ideas uh, becoming more and more prevalent, and we support that from around the world. One of the unique things about our business is that we develop our hardware and our software uh, all in-house to make units which work anywhere. And I'll show you more about what those units are and how that works. But we offer global support. We are able to get right into customers' uh, production facilities and stores facilities and really make a difference in how people operate day to day. Uh, there's over 55,000 uh, devices around the world. And one of our key differentiators is actually we focus on quality products. So being C certified or UL in the US is absolutely critical. Now we know from our experience uh, dealing with aerospace companies uh, around the world is that that is absolutely the number one priority. It's quality, it's safety. And we ensure that all of our products are coming out correctly certified with the correct um, supply chain checks in place to ensure that we're able to support our products wherever they are. And so one of the key inventory issues in the aerospace industry that, that we see and we're aware of, well, number one, um, I would say is the foreign object debris challenge. It's there in, in most aerospace businesses at some point in the production process, how to deal with FOD, item traceability, understanding where products go, who's using them, employee efficiency. Now, as we're moving, and particularly within, within the Indian context, to a less dependent on a labored workforce, how do we ensure that our employee efficiency increases? How do we make sure that they're in the right place doing the right roles? And how do we make sure that the right products are available at the right time? And then we get into supply chain, ordering efficiency, ordering the right context, the quality, the quantity of items to be in the right place at the right time over multiple plants in multiple different regions and even multiple different territories. And finally, a key, a key issue at the moment, and I've not mentioned COVID, but COVID last year had a huge impact and still has in our aviation industries around the world. And what we're now seeing, having gone through phase one or phase two, or even phase three of COVID, is that the supply chain challenges are acute around the world. Getting products onto our factories is absolutely critical. And one of the things uh, the team and I uh, need to be looking at is, this is you know, the great policy that you've got in, in India at the moment about making India. You know, the supply chain challenges are the big thing is about reducing our supply chain lengths to ensure that products are available locally. And for the Indian aerospace market, it's about ensuring that the products are available within India uh, to be used in Indian manufacturing um, and, to, and to shorten those supply chains and to speed up the route to market. So those are the key inventory issues in the aerospace market. But what does supply point do with all this? Well, you know, lean manufacturing is a fundamental part of any manufacturing plant in the world, whether it's aerospace or, or, or making cars or it's making anything else. 
and going through the process of sorting, setting in order, shining, standardizing, and sustaining a process is absolutely critical to the long-term viability, safety um, of our plants. And here's an example of a quite a nice area with stock and inventory before and what it could look like afterwards. And our, we see our remit is about helping people to manage the processes for controlling their stocks, inventory and assets. And the lean manufacturing principles are the bedrock of, of how we make that happen. So what does it look like in one of your factories um, in India? Well, traditionally, um, vending and inventory management started on the shop floor in your storeroom, um, and we focused on manu uh, managing and controlling you know, critical items uh, day by day. But over the last 15 years, the use of point of use vending equipment and the use of the intelligent solutions has grown to cover any aspect that needs control, any aspect that you need visibility of, or any aspect that could stop your factory operating. And actually it's now available and able to be used and we've got business cases and we've got examples of where equipment and solutions can be deployed to make the whole plant more efficient and effective in terms of delivering the end product. So how does that process work? Well, part of lean manufacturing is about automation of the product ordering and, process and replenishment process. And the supply point equipment with the software drops into a plant and can be connected to people's ERP systems and computer systems. And it's about simplifying the process of reordering. It's about simplifying the access to solutions and products for, customer, for your, your users on the shop floor. And it's about stocking the right products, defining the right products, putting them in the right place. So sorting, set in order, shining, then people consume it. And then the clever thing comes in, which is all about the software and about intelligent reporting, business intelligence, making sure that um, you as the manufacturer or the user of the equipment has the right information to make the right decisions about when and where to put product in stock, all about driving value and efficiency. And then the system reorders, it gets restocked, and the process just goes round and round again to ensure that the efficiencies from effective inventory management is properly realized. So what about smart systems for smart factories? We've all heard about Internet of Things, um, Industry 4.0, even Industry 5.0 with the use of robotics. Well, the, our solutions can sit at the heart of that or on the edge of that and actually are a driver towards the Internet of Things. It's about taking information, creating it as data and then utilizing it. And our, and our solutions, can, can control and manage a whole range of different products and devices. We can manage keys into different areas, cutting tools and tool life management, CNC machine spares, smart bins with weigh scales, spindle management, you name it, and there's a whole lot more. Anything that moves or is deemed inventory or an asset, we can work out how best to control it and give the visibility electronically to allow you to make better decisions. So what we're saying here really is that the supply point solutions come together and what they do is they create this data and then that data can then be used to create reporting to decide what to do next it can be used to uh, be based on in the cloud which allows access from anywhere and allows you to link your sites across india across the world across wherever to ensure that you've got overall visibility of what's being used where to ensure that consumption is is appropriately managed the data can be used to go straight into your stores to give them better visibility of what's being used and when. And then it can be go be put into any other system or database to allow you to use whatever that might be to, to better understand the information. And so it's about bringing smart information and solutions into the heart of the factory. And so how do we do that? And why is this important for people? Well, on the right hand side, there's a lot of different there's management, production, purchasing, stores, operators. Every area of a business has a need to control inventory and stocks better. And actually it's about making sure that what is the reason, what is the value or the saving that each of these areas need to, um, need to realize to help their business be better and to help us aim higher in how we manufacture more efficiently, how we manage stocks more effectively and how we produce products at a lower cost. And ultimately making inventory smart, being system driven is about bringing 
um, control to a process which is often been a bit erratic and paper orientated and difficult to, to visualize. So we're looking about how do we bring control to the systems and actually removing that complication from people's businesses, allowing them to focus on, as we've heard from my colleagues, building aerospace, aero engines or building satellites and not worrying about is the right product available um, when they need it. So here at Supply Point, we're, we're, we're pleased to offer a whole range of solutions. And we know that one size or one type of unit does not help everybody. And you can see from the screen here, and this is a range of devices live with customers uh, in India and around the world, you can see that we can hold and manage and control a whole variety of different products and uh, devices. And actually, it, it allows us to fix and to configure combinations which are unique to customers' needs and requirements, which is really important. So where does this all kind of lead us? So benefits to users. Well, controlling your inventory in the grand scheme of things seems like quite a minor thing to do. But we know from experience that we can save our, our customers between 25 and 40 percent of the products that they control. It's about bringing control. We know that we can lower stock costs, which from a manufacturing business perspective, allows you to increase your working capital and spend your money in areas where you really want to add value. It allows you to optimize your inventory based on what is actually being used. And it provides an audit trail of everything that has been issued or returned or utilized. And that helps massively in delivering a robust and reliable FOD control system where you know who's had what, where they've had it, when they brought it back, or more importantly, if they haven't brought it back, where might it be? So you can speed up um, the handling of those issues. You've got product 24 hours a day, seven days a week without having manned stores. You've got controlled access. Certain people can have access to certain products. And you can reduce the amount of time people spend going to pick up items from their stores by putting units and, and product right next to where they manufacture. And finally, linking it all back into the I IoT Industry 4.0, it's using the data, the, the data which is created to integrate to all your other systems to allow you to make informed and educated decisions to make the best use of the stock that you've got on your shop floor and the inventories, allowing you to, to buy better, um, manage your plants better, and uh, produce more of your core products more efficiently. So... Coming back to the key inventory issues, Indian aerospace industry. Well, it's the same around the world if you're looking at the aerospace and defense sector. Absolutely, these items on here are absolutely critical in terms of ensuring that manufacturing in this sector can continue to develop and grow and aim higher. And I don't know any manufacturing plant manager who is not trying to continuously improve and improve their offering, reduce their costs and increase their output. In my own factories, we are doing that every month by evaluating all the metrics to ensure that we are delivering quality projects. And actually our own vending machines, we use time and time again to ensure that that, that is the case. And I think that combined with the, the, the make in India, the supply chain challenges that are hitting us all around the world and all of our partners and customers are talking of these huge pressures. How do we make products locally? How do we manage the supply chains? And uh, Supply Point have solutions to allow you to do that. And you know, Rizwan and my team in India um, are, are experts in delivering solutions to really drive value. So that's, that's kind of my overview of Supply Point. Um, we are excited to partner with many aviation com companies around the world and really excited to be working uh, here in India and, and helping host this event today. So I'll pass, um, I'll pass you back to uh, uh, our esteemed host to, um, to uh, uh, drive on with the, the panel discussion. Thank you, Mark, for that engaging presentation. I have so many questions and I, I'm sure so many viewers would also have questions based on your presentation. Please feel free to ask Mark any question that you have in mind at the end of the session. And he can also answer your questions offline. We'll share the coordinates with you. Now, about the subject in hand for which I'll invite our esteemed panelists to present their views, which is the potential of India's aerospace industry. Now, the top strengths that make India an attractive hub for the aerospace industry are a large commercial market, 
a strong pool of local talent and high defense spending. Then there is another strength that has become a strong draw in these recent years, a vast supplier ecosystem built on the rich legacy of India's thriving automotive and space technology industries. The last year and a half, however, has been really tough. And this pandemic has ended more than a decade of uninterrupted growth in 2020. Reports estimate that the size of the global aerospace industry fell from $342.4 billion in 2019 to $296 billion in 2020 at the rate of a negative 14%. On their part, India's industry stakeholders have braved these headwinds in a very exemplary, exemplary fashion. Uh, I recently got to speak with, speak with Simi, who's here with us, who's the CEO of IAMPL, a JV between Rolls-Royce and HAL, and he shared with us how he braved uh, the pandemic and how he came up with a unique solutions to serve his customers. And I'm going to ask the same question uh, to Mr. Vaidya and Mark as well. So the subject at hand is how India's aerospace industry can realize its true potential. But before that, let's have our panelists' views on what has happened during the last one year. Uh, the slowdown, this aerospace industry has been the hardest hit. Uh, now you see the crisis impacting you know, the mid to long-term plans of global OEMs like Boeing and Air Airbus. So I, my question to you is, how have you seen the crisis impacting the global and Indian supplier ecosystem? And what are the key measures that suppliers could follow to face these challenges? I'll start uh, the round of answers with Sini. What are your views, Sini? Yeah, thanks, Anand, for that obvious question and very you know, relevant to the situation what we have on hand. Yeah, all the Boeing, Airbus, kind of our uh, in frame in, in air framers, they are hit very hard. And if I may split the whole industry into three segments, like one is the defense, business aviation, and the commercial aerospace. The first one, defense is steady and the business jets, I mean, the business aviation is impacted, but the worst impact is with the commercial aerospace area. So for the discussion's sake, let us pick up the commercial aerospace now. I mean, last one and a half years been very tough as the volumes have gone down dramatically. But the good news is as we see foresee for the next couple of years, it, the revival, the worst is kind of over and with the vaccination happening around the world, the travel is likely to start very soon and it's going to happen. But it has created kind of, you know, a lot of, uh, for the Indian aerospace supply system, ecosystem, we are also hit very hard. But how do we overcome that? You know, we we'll have to adapt, I mean, uh, uh, various, uh, measures like you know multi-skilling our resources utilizing the resources with automation technologies coupled with it and those are all the cost control measures which we will adapt and overcome that but what is making life interesting is the opportunity that's coming along after this uh, pandemic which is the i mean the coming quarters going to be like you know the i mean everybody is interested in cost savings all our customers so with that you know, we are well placed as a region, you know, in, in the reason, there are two, three reasons. One is there are uh, in the developed world because of the impact, getting back the workforce back to work is becoming increasingly difficult. And second one is the geopolitical tensions across the world is providing another opportunity for India. Third thing with the inherent strength of cost competitiveness in India, with the availability of uh, talent, both in terms of uh, skilled and the engineers uh, kind of with the knowledge of uh, digital technology is making our presence, you know, it's, it's going to create more opportunities better than the past. So we will be, you know, we, uh, personally, I'm looking, this as a huge opportunity ahead of us. And it's, it's going to be, you know, I mean, coming 10 years is going to belong to us. That's my personal feeling. Thank you for that optimistic note, Simi. 
Mr. Vaidya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so as uh, all of you know that uh, I mean, the, the civil aviation has been uh, drastically impacted uh, and uh, it is going to have uh, serious repercussions. Currently, we are operating at around 30% of our capacity and uh, doesn't seem to be growing up, at least in this calendar year, probably the 22 and 2023 looks to be promising years. But I would like to bring a different perspective or different angle to this. I mean, just pre-COVID, you must be uh, knowing that it is all the kind of a bipody between uh, Airbus and Boeing who were dominating the civil aviation. And uh, thanks to uh, whatever environmental rules and regulations and the new norms which are coming up and the fuel efficiency which has become a very important for the airliners, the old established airlines were also in process of replacing their old aircrafts. And the new markets like Asian markets and other markets like China and Russia, they were emerging. So suddenly there was an increase in the number of uh, aircrafts which were ordered by all the airlines. Now, as we know that uh, the white body aircrafts are normally used for the inter-country uh, travel, whereas uh, single uh, aisle aircrafts are used into the domestic. Now, 737 and 320, they were dominating this market in the single aisle, but uh, uh, I think uh, looking at the potential, the China regional jet, the Mitsubishi regional jet, the Bombardier regional jet, uh, Embraer uh, regional jet, and the many other projects and programs are on in English. So in a way, because of this pandemic, I think these other countries, uh, all the other regional jet programs got a breather because they were losing opportunity by the time they would have come with all their uh, approvals. Uh, the market would have been flooded by Airbus and Boeing. But I think this has really created a kind of a level playing field uh, which was not really desired. We all know how pandemic is impacting us. But as far as those organizations are concerned or the civil aviation is concerned, I think it was a kind of a blessing to them that this pandemic hit and it has deferred the market. I'm not saying that the market has been lost. The market has been deferred by two to three years by all the airlines. And now there will be a new thinking. There will be a new vision which will be set up by all the airlines. And once the China regional jet, the Mitsubishi regional jet, the Bombardier regional jet, the three countries who are heavily supporting Airbus and Boeing today, all those, they will be busy in making their own domestic aircrafts other than supporting Airbus and Boeing. And I see that as a great opportunity for the other high growth region uh, countries like the East European bloc, uh, South Asian countries, India, to really take all this workload which is likely to get more out from these three countries to this high growth region. And that is where I think in this uh, lower period, we use this opportunity as the Sini said, to really increase our capabilities, to invest into some new technologies, to acquire certain things, which otherwise we would not have got time to really think because we would have been busy in the production and get ready for this opportunity to come after two years or three years. So a lot of diversification, and a lot of new technology investment, a lot of recruitment, training, qualification, because that's one of the very lengthy process. However, there was some uh, issue which happened, but we could resolve that issue of how to really invest. Because when you are going to put a capital investment and not likely to have immediate uh, returns to come, then it becomes an important point. But we could manage to resolve even those issues. And thanks to, I think, government's Atmanirbhar scheme, even though the civil aviation market has come down, there was a equal boost has happened because of the military. And uh, because we are, as I explained in my earlier uh, introduction, that we are well placed between space and uh, the defense and uh, the civil aviation. And that really helped us to move and get into this extra money for us to invest. So I think it's a great opportunity. I'm looking personally very uh, look forward to the next two years, three years, how the entire thing, the geopolitical situation is going to emerge. And we are keeping a close watch on that and uh, trying to play our cards at appropriate time with the appropriate measures. So thank you with this uh, in the initial uh, question, what you asked, Mr. Anand.
Thank you, Mr. Vaidya, for that insightful note. Mark? Yeah, the, the impact, as my colleagues have said, has been uh, dramatic. And um, uh, around the world, we've seen, you know, obviously, aviation and civil aviation absolutely fall off. Defence, absolutely, governments have kept that pretty well um, invested in, which has meant a number of our, our partners and customers have continued to operate quite effectively during uh, the pandemic. But the aviation industry itself has been uh, decimated. And only yesterday, um, the, the flag carrier for the UK British Airways announced that it was putting more people on the furlough scheme because the international markets for aviation are just not opening up across Europe. We know that in America, we know that in China, um, that aviation internally, domestically, is back up to pa pre-pandemic levels. People are back on aeroplanes, uh, traveling and flying, and that is having a knock-on effect on the, on the aviation industry, which is beginning to get back to uh, where it was before. But it mustn't be underestimated, the in impact of international travel and the lack of it. And uh, the requirements that um, you know, all the suppliers in, in the aerospace industry have um, um, and are dependent on international travel. So the impact was dramatic. And one of the key things that we saw was that most manufacturing plants were not allowing suppliers um, and prospective customers onto their plants for fear of the transmission of COVID. And that has led to a real lockdown in terms of knowledge transfer and information uh, transferring and really getting things done. And after, I suppose, the middle of last year, that started to relax a bit, but all areas of the world have had extra phases of COVID. And while that doesn't appear to have impacted manufacturing too much, it has impacted on business travel and it has impacted on personal travel um, it, domestically. So, so what? Well, I think most of the businesses in the aerospace industry are continuing to operate. Um, government schemes around the world have helped tremendously in ensuring that people remain employed and that um, knowledge, expertise and skills remain in those businesses. And actually, we're seeing a lot of those businesses come back online and back engaging with us and in, in other parts of the business that we deal with to look into the future and say, well, actually, this is going to come back. I'm fascinated by the view of... Um, the emerging markets, the Bombardiers, the Mitsubishis, and their development into the narrow, um, the, sing the single aisle um, uh, aeroplanes. And that's a really interesting uh, shift from the Boeings and the Airbuses which are coming. Um, but as we know, aircraft have a huge long lifespan. And I think the, the impact of the, the coronavirus is going to be with us. And we're not going to see travel realistically back until the middle of next year but we are seeing growth in many industries. And if you look at the American market, it is absolutely flying at the moment with the government investments and the, the $6 trillion that President Biden has pumped into the economy is really driving consumer spending, which is knocking all the way through. People are buying things, people are buying flights, people are traveling. Um, we wait for the international opening of, of air travel once it's safe to really see the aviation industry pick up again. Thank you, Mark. I'll stay on this question a little bit longer about the global scenario uh, because we see a divergent position right now uh, in how Europe is opening up and how America has already opened. In India also, uh, you know, the situation is opaque in, in the sense that we do not know when we'll completely open up and opening up is very important for this industry to function as, as your gentleman rightly pointed out. Uh, now, my question to you is more based on uh, the near term future as to how the situation will emerge uh, globally. As Mark uh, pointed out that the um, American industry is now flying metaphorically as well as figuratively. Uh, but uh, Europe, again, uh, is thinking of uh, going back to certain lockdown measures because of some strains now uh, coming up and, and, and incidentally, France, for example, is the second largest uh, market in the world or second largest producer in the aerospace sector, uh, followed by China, uh, where again, there are some reports that, you know, some part of the country may close down because of a resurgence of cases. Uh, so other than USA, the situation is not very clear. 
so my question to you gentlemen is that uh, what is the the scenario the timeline that you see for this market uh, globally to open up and um, the co creation the technology and everything the trade to come back on on track i'll start with sini and sini uh, serves two very iconic brands one uh, british and one uh, indian and sini what is your view of when you, you see the market uh, opening up and opportunities coming up the way of the suppliers in india and elsewhere yes again <clears throat> thanks anand for that question yeah from uh, civil aerospace side it's going to take at least couple of more years to get back to the pre pandemic and the revival is going to be faster in the narrow aisle engine in narrow aisle aircrafts than the wide body aircrafts so that's the scenario as we see today but on the other side with other our other association with the hal it's a defense side so that's steady the defense side of the market is steady with the geopolitical tensions tensions around the world and everyone trying to protect their country so that's going steady but the civil it's going to take a couple of uh, more years minimum to get back to the normalcy so but having said that as a supplier in that ecosystem knowing that it's going to take two more years and what are going to be their uh, i mean priorities after two years these oes air framers and their uh, tire ones have already started preparing for that you know they are preparing for what's going to happen after two years and what is their preparedness so everyone is trying to as i, as I said before everyone is looking at uh, cost optimization as their priority second thing the when when it bounces back they are all worried about whether they have the capacity to cater to that bouncing back of 2324 so that is where you know we we see like there is an we are preparing it's not for current year or next year we are preparing for at least 23 24 25 so that is what we are preparing today if you ask me so from that perspective i see that again uh, there is an opportunity available for us when everybody is thinking today because as you as you already know that you know, the aerospace industry is a long gestation uh, i mean industry where the even the development times for switching over a vendor it takes 2 to 3 years so when somebody is thinking about thinking about the revival of 2023 23 24 they are already thinking about how to make plans and how to get that switched for 2023 today so that is where our networking and our connection with our probable partners is very important and showcase our capability to meet that you know opportunity is very important today that's my view on over to you thank you jaimi mr vaidya how do you yeah. see this panning out i agree with sini that uh, it is uh, going to take at least two more years and uh, 23 24 only we should see uh, once again at least the same numbers of pre covid if not uh, more but i think uh, as i said the domestic defense is really doing great and a lot of potential especially with uh, the 83 uh, hl uh, got order for the lca that is going to bring in a lot of uh, revenue to the private industries also and i think recently uh, the decision which has been taken uh, to really uh, get more and more our uh, systems ready towards uh, safeguarding our borders in the north i think that is also going to help us to improve our participation and uh, i think uh, the another big program what uh, drdo announced is uh, revival of a kaveri engine which uh, is uh, a very important uh, asset for any uh, flying object to have its own propulsion system made in the country i think these two three things will make us survive in this difficult time thank you some very excellent points mr vaidya mark how do you see this panning out the global scenario and especially the fact that the top three producers are from three different continents yeah it's um I, I think when I look at what's happened in America, um, I am surprised, and I, I talk to other people at how rapidly the recovery has has come back. And actually, the American market is roaring into an inflationary period now, which they've not seen since the late 1990s, which is not normal following on from a recession. 
Um, and is this due to the government's um, investment? It probably is. But that's bouncing back far quicker from an economy perspective than anticipated. Europe, um, still in the doldrums, um, very mixed in terms of what is happening. The UK is in lock, it remains pretty tightly locked down. Life in the UK is fine. But in terms of international um, connectivity, it, it's all cut off. Continental Europe was only just this last week um, opened up to international cross-border travel. You move over to China, booming um, internal uh, markets. Again, international is absolutely locked down. And then the, India at the moment, from, from what I understand, and, and uh, all, my, all, all people on this call here uh, will know far better than, than I am, that the challenges in the situation that India is in at the moment. So we know that we have um, had a, an exceptional bounce back in America. We know that China is strong following this, um, and Europe is a, a while a while behind. I mean, I think in terms of economic activity, I think America will remain strong and growing probably to the back end of next year, 2022. Europe probably won't start until Q4 in 2021, and then run yeah. through into 2023. So there's a whole lot of things going on in the market, and when we bring that back into what we're all interested here about the aviation market, the aerospace market, it's, it's, it's difficult to see how that's going to, to pan out with the actual aerospace manufacturers themselves. I think those businesses who have continued to invest during the last 14 months um, in technologies and developments are going to be in a far better place than those who have just chosen to shut down. And again, we know from, our, from the way we deal with our partners is that some companies have just shut down and said, actually, we're going to take advantage of government schemes and we're going to produce our workforce. Other people have, and we're one of them, we've continued to invest in our development team because we see this as an opportunity to work for the, for the last 12 months and the next 12 months on bringing new and exciting things to the market. And likewise, in the aerospace industry, most businesses are continuing to push forward with their investment. And can we leapfrog? Um, our competitors who have maybe taken a pause in things. So the investment continues. Um, I hope that the world follows the American model in terms of you know, real strong inflationary growth, because that's that's driving air travel, it's driving all sorts of things domestically. And once the vaccines are in place and consistent globally, and it's not just the West who've got the, the vaccines rolled out massively, but it's, it's globally, then we'll see international travel. And then we'll see that um, the pickup in the aerospace industry at a, at a kind of a consistent level around the world. So, uh, you know, I, I see America being strong until through till next year, Europe probably the end of next year, the year after. India, I think you guys are better placed than I am. Um, and then China, um, I think kind of the end of this year, they will be back to normal. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That, that is really help, helpful. Uh, thoughts on how this is going to pan out and that you know makes me think about how india is placed um, in the overall scenario now if you if we look at the global aerospace market we see that um, the us accounts for close to uh, close to 49% of the global aerospace industry and then the top 3 as I said, uh, top three markets are US and France and China. UK is the fourth as per the report that I have. India is among the top 10 markets. And, uh, but in terms of percentage, it is in single digits. And, this, and, the, and the supply and the type of supplies from India are limited to tier two to tier, to tier four, which is parts and assemblies and you know, made to print parts and components and raw materials and forgings and castings and also MRO activities that are happening in India, which uh, some in the, in the industry called wrench turning activities. Uh, so that these are uh, very prevalent in India. Now I want to ask the panelists as to how do they see the real strengths and legacies of the Indian aerospace market? Um, number one, number two, is that how can India move up the global value chain of the aerospace industry? I'll start with Sino. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Anand. That's a, that's a very good question in current times. 
it's going to help our future inherent strengths of the indian i mean i'll answer in two parts inherent strengths and legacies of indian aerospace industry the as as you know what is the what is that aerospace industry is looking for you know if we look at from the customer angle what is what is that they are expecting yeah one is uh, yeah aerospace is the traceability maintenance of the traceability fod kind of uh, uh, workspace culture is very important and that comes with uh, kind of the investments what we are what we can plan and do that and the most other important thing is kind of a sustainable zero defect is a important thing for the aerospace industry uh, which is very important and 100% on time deliveries are also very very critical for them and the development speed is very much important when they switch over the vendors and after all this the most important thing all these things are required at a competitive cost levels or the cost should be kind of motivating them to make some switch overs it should be attractive for changes to happen now considering the risks what the what the i mean the customers or the partners are going to take so what is available from india as a legacy you know come come com, com, coming back to the zero defect or the we have the talented engineering pool you know, coming out of india close to 500000 engineers coming out of college every year and we have a larger talent pool available with us so those guys have a proper understanding of you know how we can make a zero defect program to work so we can so the kind of you know the understanding of our our engineers are kind of you know competitive and we can make the zero defect programs to work and we have demon, we are demonstrating that so that's very important for the aerospace industry second thing the development speed which is again very important and you know uh, current currently you know the, the the people are people are not willing to put money into something where where the return on I mean, the, if the return on investment is not going to be, you know, within the required period of years by the investors, it's not going to work. So, which means the velocity of the business, you no know, development speed is very important. There again, the engineering talent of India, that which is an inherent strength, can play a major role. And you can see, like, you know, all the all the OE majors, starting from Boeing or Airbus, or or you name anybody, they have their engineering center in India. That is something, you know, which will act as an advantage for future. which can we can integrate that engineering strength with the manufacturing that's going to happen in india and we can develop parts faster and deliver deliver it consistently so that's another inherent advantage what we have because of you know our indian uh, demographics in terms of uh, capabilities available so coming back to the next question how do we move up the global value chain i think that's that's what is your next part of the question am i right so okay. yeah so for that you know which is a very valid question instead of only being a component supplier or a part maker which anybody can catch up with us in the question of maybe question of few few years difference the only way is we have to continue to go up the value chain today from a component manufacturer we have to become an integrator from an integrator to a module builder that is very very important because more and more the oes or our partners don't want to deal with multiple suppliers they were they are in the process of kind of you know uh, consolidating their vendor base and they want to deal with few suppliers who are very reliable in which which kind of you know they want to deal with module builders so the sooner we go to that stage it is better for us how do we do that that can happen you know more important thing is the technology plays a critical role for us to achieve that that locate that particular kind of uh, vision the most important thing for that is partnership you know we love to realize that you know we cannot win the game alone and nobody in this today scenario it, it's there's a big learning over the last one and a half years when we are hit all of us are hit and when we grow it is not that one or two guys are going to grow is it possible to embrace each other's strength and create partnership and grow in this space that's going to be very very important creating partnerships and you know understanding the strength of each other and creating our talent pool to be a part of it it's going that's going to be the answer for moving up the global value chain so the sooner you know there are there are a lot of things happening in that space maybe my uh, i mean friend vidya can also you know talk about that because they are one of the oldest groups who are uh, working on this for a long time i mean the partnerships are going to be the future game you know when we when we want to move up in the global value chain thank you so much everyone thank you sivin great points there
I will bring two aspects. One is that the strength is that I think India has more than uh, three decades of experience in uh, developing aero and defense systems. I think we have a uh, fantastic number of uh, more than 5,000 plus uh, scientists at DRDO at ISRO. More than uh, 1,500 industries uh, in India today uh, engaged with uh, either ISRO, DRDO or the PSUs or with the global civil aviation market. But as you rightly said, I mean, uh, most of our participation with the global civil aviation has been limited to tier three or tier four, that is built to print and parts produced uh, at uh, level and not really getting into the subsystems and assemblies, even though for domestic use, we are building the complete systems. But uh, I think there is a, a huge difference. I mean, when we talk of uh, producing those assemblies, at a rate of 30 to 40 in a month. And when we are talking in domestically to produce a complex assembly at a rate of three to four or five per year, it makes a huge difference. And I think that is something which we need to really learn. It is not that only having a good academic uh, research or uh, getting it into near to the product, but not actually reaching the product. And that is where just handful of products from the Indian aerospace business or aerospace market has been accepted by the end users, whether it is armed forces or by any other, uh, even we are not using today most of the, the systems which have been put up by the ISRO for our own use. The GPS is still the American GPS. That is what we prefer on our mobile phones and we don't use the web and what has been used by the ISRO. So I think this is what we need to learn. Even though we have some inherent strength, basic infrastructure, a lot of test facilities, but getting into a product and making that product more user-friendly so that it can be really accepted by everyone, uh, right from the defense forces to the uh, individual user like us, then I think we will be able to really gain. And uh, current policies, what has been taken or the strategies, what has been taken, opening up a space for private industries, Atmanirbhar banning more than 209 items, making 108 technologies available to Indian industries. A lot of funding. I think uh, there is a very good uh, tie up which is being found out between the public private partnership. All these days, it used to be kind of a, that the PSUs will do their own job right from making a washer to aircraft and the private industries will get engaged with something else and nobody will talk to each other. I think that phase has gone and I look forward that uh, this will really take us to a uh, next uh, level and not only make our own uh, self-sufficiency, but I think we should be ready for the export also. Thank you. Wow. These are very encouraging thoughts and I'm personally learning so much and I'm sure our viewers are as well. Mark, your thoughts on the question? It, clearly, I'm an outsider um, uh, to India, um, but I, what I see is the real strength is the uh, is the technical capability and the expertise of, of, of generally the Indian people. You know, the, the, the colleges, the universities, the the talent that's being produced. You know, that is something which is kind of really being pushed on and developed over the years. And and as we've just heard, the numbers of uh, scientists and technicians and and uh, and skilled. Um, uh, operatives coming out is huge and utilizing that and developing that and continue to grow um, that skill base is one of those key parts to help help um, at a base level to help uh, India move up that that league table and get a higher percentage of the, the global spend I agree completely getting those larger modules getting those bigger pieces less of the smaller aspects and the, the foundry work etc will help tremendously but one of the huge things that um, that India's got, which um, which actually all, all all the company all the countries who are who are who are above India in the aerospace market, is that the India's got a, a tremendous defence budget, and uh, the military defend spending uh, is is vast. How can that be converted into civil and aerospace and wider applications? I mean, it's the age old challenge, isn't it? In in all countries, if you develop things for the military. How do you commercialize that so that it can be used and uh, really ge generate revenues and improve uh, a country's own technical prowess in, uh, in, in things? So that's an area where I really think that, that, that India could utilize some of those skills it's developed for the military into the commercial aspect. 
But the other, the, the final aspect I would say in moving up the supply chain is, um, and Simi uh, alluded to this, is you know, foreign object debris, building on time, building to quality, all those things are absolutely critical in almost all industries, but are specifically critical in an aerospace industry where one failure can mean the loss of an aircraft and actually continue to invest in the processes and the technologies to ensure that the factories are compliance and world-class, you know, better than world-class, you know, maybe world beating and actually pushing some of the technical talent into actually making sure that the factories are running in that in that particular way is a way in which actually would, would, would help leapfrog into the future. Um, but again, I mean, when I visit, visit India, I am just blown away by the talent and the commitment and the passion that people have for, for, for making things happen. And so I think uh, with time that that will move up from, I think, where are you eighth at the moment in that, in this kind of league table um, and moving up uh, that league table is uh, eminently possible. Thanks, Mark. Now that brings us to the next point. And Sini, I will begin this, this question with you. You raised some really excellent points uh, for the last question about the velocity of development, uh, the talent pool that we have in India. One aspect that your company has also done wonders in is digitization that has gone through a tectonic shift as, uh, in India uh, and the world in the last year and a half during the pandemic. Uh, now, this question is uh, composed of two parts. One is what has been your experience other than the obvious uh, work from home and remote working and, and similar things where digitization has played a role in terms of the shop floor, particularly, uh, which is not seen um, you know, by, by people like us. So what has been the role of digitization in terms of its increase and adoption, increase of usage and adoption in the aerospace industry? And the second question is, how can it help the Indian industry co-create with the global pairs? And where do we stand in digitization in this whole gamut? Thank you, Anand. And that's another interesting question. And then we need to adapt digitization very fast. I mean. Again, coming back to it, it's not that we are pushing digitization because it's, it's again that there's a demand from the customer and the whole world is going towards it. And if you can be faster towards that, then you get an advantage for that. So it's going to be an enabler, which is going to create an advantage to our business. That's what is the most important driving factor. And not only that it's not doing it one time, the difficult part of the aspect comes in, you know, you cannot create an advantage one time and leave it. How do we sustain that advantage is going to be the next important or the most, most difficult challenge for us in that. So that is where the digitization plays a big role. And particularly what we have done over the last year and a half, we have accelerated the adoption of uh, digitization. In, in kind of, you know, our factory today is digitally managed with uh, MES, the GE Prophecy MES, where, you know, all the schedules, it's like a paperless factory and all the machines are integrated with that integrated with the MES, MES tool, wherein all the inspection by the operator is automatically you know, transferred to the MES and some of the, basically if I talk about uh, the capability of, of capability measurements of, for example, the CPK, CP, CPK measurements of a, pro, I mean, of a process, it, it's kind of automatically measured by these tools. And next most important thing to achieve zero defect is the controls. The one we start with capability, Next one is the controls. We talk about here the statistical process controls. They are integrated as a part of our manufacturing, which is very important. And they are continuously measured. And if anything is going expected to go out of tolerance, then immediately our engineers who are there in the shop get an alert message in their mobile that something is you know, something is traveling out of shape. And you may you know, then they know that it's not the damage done, it's kind of a prediction that is that is happening today. So people know it's, it's, I mean, postmortem is of no use today. I mean, the prediction is very, very important. The predictive analysis is built in our, uh, our, our system. So our engineers get a kind of a trigger when something is going to go wrong and they immediately come, stop, fix, and then start. That, that enables a kind of a, a kind of, you know, a competitive 
manufacturing process run in our factory run in our factory and most importantly after that control accountability is again more important most important thing for us so we start with the capability we start with the controls and we have to complete that with a kind of accountability by people and everybody knows that everybody is a owner i mean starting from the guy who manages the machine he is the owner of that and he owns the zero defect and delivery of that particular particular business whatever he is running and similarly there are other people who are responsible at the at the accountability is created at the part level and they that's also digitally enabled so those guys know like what is their performance with respect to the with respect to the i mean part what they are managing and the process what they are managing so it's a kind of a matrix which is possible for us to measure on a live basis it is not at a kind of yesterday stuff what we are measuring today we measure this live kind of you know we measure this we measure this live and people are aware of what's happening and this this helps us to reduce the non conformances this reduces kind of help us to prevent the scrap and move towards assure a zero defect assurance to our customers this is very very important in aerospace industry the customers the the disadvantage today while we talk about all whatever we sell like you know we have a technical advantage you know we have a, a ability of uh, digital but the most important thing is the the real manufacturing of the aircrafts happen at least kind of uh, 6000 kilometers or 12000 kilometers away from india the only way they are going to believe us is like you know they want to like a kind of a live connection to see like what's happening in your factory is what they are expected you know that's something you know which we are today we can give a live connection to our partners so that you know they can see what is happening in our live in our factory so that way digitalization is very important second thing as i told you know velocity is very very important just to point it out that is there is an, there are opportunities going to come to us i mean yeah it may be the but the variations are going to be it's not going to be very steady it may be like for one year we may get a lot of opportunities in the next year it's going to be down by 50% this situation is going to continue how do we manage that so we cannot you know kind of uh, vary the resources the engineering talent pool whenever we want it requires a kind of certain period of experience to mature so this is where we thought like you know the another way of tackling this is adapting the latest technology kind of an ai based kind of uh, defining our design process to a ai technology and where we can use the technology to build 60% of our method definition and then our people can add value by analyzing it and improvising it this is something which we are we have, we have partner with an institution and trying to drive this for our future so where in this will help us to improve our speed of developing new projects and this is going to happen continuously so we are preparing for the future and when this happens through image processing and a based image processing technology and the i mean the error the room for error is, error is going to be minimized and also you know we are as you know as mark rightly said you know we love to define our capability best in class and redefine that best in class again and again that is very important so for that you know we are going to use the engineers not to do the routine things we want the routine routine programmable things to happen using the ai based technologies whereas we will use the engineers to think think innovative and improve from there so that is when we are also adapting ai based technology for doing some of the design work and progressing on that thank you thank you these are very helpful points mr vaidya yeah so i fully agree with what uh, sinni said that i would just like to bring three other points one is that uh, aerospace is a highly kind of a regimented uh, kind of a industry uh, more than uh, what you produce you have to keep on documenting as to how you produced it what resources you used who did that particular thing we call that as a routing sheets and those sheets speak for uh, uh, later on for a success or for a failure because as you know i mean it's not like a motor vehicle on a road if not uh, doesn't work you can take it aside and then somebody can come and attend to it if it is a missile it is going to collapse if it is a launch vehicle for space it is not going to come back if it is a aircraft which is flying and will get uh, crushed in case of any eventualities i think what is going to speak is only the papers or the documents what we are going to really make it and in such a scenario when everything has to get recorded to its finest and the last digit i think there is no better solution than digitization and really putting all this industry 4.0 we 
we were doing it completely manual and just to give an example i mean when we were making an engine for our prithvi missile the entire engine which used to carry almost 3 tons of prithvi to a distance of 500 600 kilometers was weighing about 57.3 kilograms but the amount of document we were supplying along with each engine was more than 100 kilograms so you can understand wow. what the ratio is there and the amount of data to be really put in by the aerospace industries and keeping that manually means you are inviting for trouble because there will be a error when you are going to really copy it from block books to other things so this is where i think the digitization and industry 4.0 is we are trying to use at its maximum the difficulty here is that even though we have brilliant softwares and software engineers available we lack heavily into the hardware finally the softwares will work only when the sensors and other apparatus are going to catch what we actually want to do it while production while design while quality control or while doing any other test and witnessing it so all that has to be captured now we don't really produce a good quality cameras in india we don't produce good quality temperature sensors we don't produce vibration sensors so in such case we are heavily dependent on bringing all the hardware from outside and the second important aspect here is that most of our machines whether it is for metal cutting whether it is for metal joining whether it is for testing all such facilities are also produced not hardly 5 to 10% of them is produced in india all of them are produced outside so once again we are dependent on the oems abroad to really incorporate all this uh, different uh, iot's and give it to us and when you go and ask for such a highly sophisticated uh, machines india is always under the embargo list you have to really obtain lot of clearances like bafa clearance metic clearance entity list clearance before you can import this sophisticated machines and in addition to that you are going to ask them to add these sensors and give it to you that means you have procurement time is going to increase not just 8 to 9 months as we are having it today to maybe additional 8 to 9 months to obtain various clearances from those respective governments so that is where we are appealing the indian machine tool manufacturers that they should really come forward and take this task the entire ecosystem when we talk it is not the ecosystem which is directly related to aerospace which is going to make uh, the success or make a great uh, issue out of it it is i think the rest of the people who are going to do it like raw material manufacturers uh, then all the test equipments all the ndt we don't produce anything like healthcare we have seen the fiasco what has happened right from making the ventilators to every equipment we were dependent on the broad to get it and same thing happens today in the aerospace also we are what we are using is only the indian land indian electric power indian manpower that's all rest everything comes from abroad material comes from abroad equipment comes from abroad test equipments come from abroad certification happens from abroad we don't have institutes like pri to offer an ad cap here to us now we are at least learn how to get really as 9100 mandatory certificates for us so that is where i think the, the there is an importance for digitization but at the same time we have huge challenges in india for us to solve thank you wow mr vaidya you uh, have our everybody's task cut out for the next you no know, 10 20 years and you've put it so succinctly so clearly and you said what needs to be said and you spoke for all of us in the industry when you, when you spoke about what are the resources available and where do we have to reach thank you so much for that scintillating and very 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 helpful chain of thoughts uh mark what what is your view on digitization from from your standpoint okay so uh, fantastic points there um i i've just heard and uh, i've been writing lots of those down but I, just th- three broad points for me one is internally in our own business the whole digitalization of how we've done business has sped a number of processes up by connecting people quicker together the use of zoom or teams or webex has brought teams and the acceptance of teams that this is the way to work prior to the pandemic uh, we would have meetings online and we'll go we'll talk about this when we get together and that's now not possible so actually we are actually getting to decisions design decisions we're developing new products and solutions and software all using online tools which 
we were doing a bit before, but it's forced us to digitalize better. And likewise, when we're talking with our with our customers and partners, um, again, we would in the past have let me come and see you and let's understand the problem. We've had to be um, adaptive to how do we do that? And we've sent people out, our technicians or our salespeople with cameras on hats and things to understand what they're doing, um, a customer's doing, and to work out what the best solution is. And again, it's using the digital concepts and the digital packages that we have to try and speed up the process. So that's internal. And working with our partners, the second part, um, that's, again, it's been very frustrating to start with because we want to work with people. I want to work with people face to face. I would much rather be in a conference room somewhere uh, with all of us where we could talk about um, the issues at hand and other things. But digitalization has meant that we had to do that remotely and it gets us to a certain point. And so I think we're more connected with more suppliers and customers than we were before, but it's in a different way. And I think the third point on digitalization is around, and it's touched on earlier on about zero defects and how do we, how do we continue to strive in our manufacturing processes? But you know, the solutions that, that we, we're offering to our customers are on that route already. Um, we, we're capturing data, we're giving it and presenting it in a way which people can make decisions. And what people are now realizing is because it can be online, it can be anywhere in the world. And actually, if you're um, the OEM providers are 6,000 kilometers away, they can see the data and the information that's available there and make their own decisions without incorporating a conference call or meetings. And then when we get into the, we talk about the paperwork and I love the, I love the picture of a 50, 50 kilogram missile and 100 kilograms of paperwork. You know, how do we move away from that? And actually the solutions that we have are all about tracking traceability creating that into data so it's available anywhere, anytime in the world and allowing people to track and trace products. Foreign object de debris. In the olden days, people had to write things down on a piece of paper. Someone had to check it. Things got missed. Now with equipment, if something's booked out and it hasn't been returned at the end of a shift, then nobody in that factory goes home until that product is found. That is a way of using the digital connectivity to bring to that particular point on the plant no one leaves his facility until that spanner, that wrench, that gauge calibration tool is located for fear of damaging the missile, the aircraft, or whatever it might, might be. So you know, with our partners, and it, it partners um, all over the world, but you know, in India with Tata Aerospace and Sikorsky, what we do end up doing is putting in solutions which are really helping them kind of go right back to the basics of, of manufacturing and using the digital op options to drive savings. If a product comes into a factory and you know when it was created, what its calibration was, where it is, you can then track who's taking it, who's using it and where it's gone. It minimizes uh, the possibility of having defects and problems and faults. And that's kind of we're seeing that happening around the world is that actually people are going, we can use this technology um, and it is digital and it's speeding up the adoption of that. So, you know, that's a broad spectrum from internal with our partners and how the solutions can really drive um, the adoption of that. But it's going to happen more and more. And you know, we talked earlier on that our ability to travel internationally is severely disrupted. And so these relationships um, that we are, that, that we're, 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 we're forming and bonding with are now digital. And actually we have to keep working out ways of how do we, how do we increase our interaction and make sure we still have those personal bonds with people um, and use the software and the solutions to deliver the value and allowing us to make the decisions and decide what is the right thing to do um, with the data at hand. Excellent, excellent points. Uh, now the last question of, of the session after which we'll open the forum to question and answers from uh, questions from the audience. The last question is around space technology. You now where is um, where we move from digits to, to personalities, uh, so to speak. Um, Elon Musk uh, has a huge fan following from India and his tweets are set to uh, raise or drop uh, his stock value by millions. And uh, thanks, thanks to him, there are a lot of kids in India today who, who follow very keenly what is happening in the world of space technology. Uh, now, India, as Mr. Vaidya so rightly 
and timely pointed out that uh, a simple thing like GPS is something that uh, we do not have the you know uh, the the capabilities for for covering a country like India, for example. Uh, at the same time, space technology is a matter of pride for any country, and and most of the investment, a lot of investment that has gone traditionally into space technology has gone for for national pride. Uh, so this is something that is uh, very very close to a country's population sentiment. So keeping all these things in mind, we have a rich legacy of ISRO and we have a supplier ecosystem uh, that is highly sophisticated. At the same time, we have a long way to go in space technology. Now, uh, I want to ask our panelists that what uh, uh, about two things, the, the positioning of our space technology industry uh, of India's space technology or space tech industries positioning. Um, a startup ecosystem, I want to really bring this up because I remember a startup from Bangalore that took part in Google's moonshot competition and it, it was one of the finalists. But at the same time, the startup did not get any opportunity and then it had to work with NASA. That is a recent incident um, pre-COVID that there are a lot of good startups coming out of India's cities, but they're they not finding opportunities locally. So they have to collaborate with companies abroad. So what are your general overall views on India's space industry? Where do we stand? What are the things that we need to do to move forward? I'll start with Sina. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Again, another uh, brilliant question. To come to the first one, the startup ecosystem for the space particularly, as you rightly said, you know, this is all uh, research and development projects and commercial viability becomes a question mark you know uh, from the investor perspective and for the startup to you know get the funding and then to also get the customer perspective of global to get the global customer perspective and not only the indian indian space it's a lot of uh, i mean kind of perseverance is required patience is required and how many of the investors have that? It, it, it's, that's a question mark. And it's a long gestation project. And it, your success or failure is again going to depend on either uh, ISRO or uh, NASA's final end product and their ability to succeed. So, or again, or can we partner with, I mean, the, do we have the ability to partner with Elon Musk today? Yeah, that's in our wish list, but not yet practically, you know, we are yet to start on that. So. From my personal perspective, we are uh, in the very, very initial stages of uh, uh, the space manufacturing. I mean, for two reasons. One is it's all, each one is a project by itself. And do we have the, I mean, bandwidth to handle project by project? It, it requires a separate list of focused uh, set of team, focused set of resources to handle it. And which means like a lot of investment required and the return on investment is going to be a questionable thing in the near future. So, but how do we make, but my point there is it's not a problem, but how do we make the world to look at India for that capability? We also have an example of, you know, how the participation of a few country like, I mean, Israel, like there's a lot of activity happening there because whole world is looking for sensors or, you know, the electronic side to, this, this particular country to kind of for anything and everything, they look at this country, including India. So how do we create, instead of focusing on everything, is it, po is it possible to focus on something which can be a sustained, which is a sustainable business model for India? The one, is it possible for a software, which is an inherent strength of India to be, you know, to be able to develop something for the space, all the space programs for the entire world? That's an opportunity. And again, into the manufacturing, maybe Mr. Vaidya can add more to it because he is a veteran in that area. Like, you know, how, how we can be an expertise in certain area instead of trying to do everything. So that is uh, my view on the space side. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Sivi. Mr. Vaidya. Yeah, Sivi, you are muted. Sorry, my, my apologies. I kept it on mute and uh, 
So I'll just try to bring uh, whatever I've learned in the last 30 years uh, working with Indian Space Program. I think uh, it's very interesting to see that India has, I think probably the DOS is one of the best example of government of India to be, uh, I mean, how a particular department can really work. The DOS is one of the fantastic uh, story to really tell and be proud of uh, all of us in India about uh, the ISRO success. Uh, but I mean, if you uh, give this, uh, that we have uh, done the PSLVs, we have done the GSLVs, we have gone to moon, we have gone to Mars, we have done so many other uh, missions very really successfully in the first attempt. But at the same time, if you want to really see the scale, and I'm immediately drawing to particularly to this, to the other side of the ISRO, is because you asked a question about the startup and started comparing with the Elon Musk. So that's why I should bring it, uh, this particular aspect to you. Uh, even though uh, we have our own DTAs, uh, I mean, direct to home, that kind of a networking system for most of our channels, how many of us are really preferring to use that DTH as compared to the network which we get it from Z and Star and uh, so many other uh, uh, offerings which are there in the international market. The second important part of what we just saw is that as digitization is important for aerospace, I think digitization is very, very important for a country like India, which is very widely spread and communication going up to the last corner of the uh, village is impossible. So that amounts to having more than 750 transponders minimum. And what so far collectively ISRO with so many launches and so many satellites which are flying, more than 80 satellites are in the orbit. Some of them are going to have a phasing out and some of them are going to get inducted. But we are not able to cross the average of more than 350 transponders against the bare minimum of 750. That means at any given moment of the time, we are having minimum 400 transponders as a shortage for effective communication what a country like India should have. And then we are dependent on the foreign satellites and we pay very heavily. Now, when the technology is available, we call that this is one of the successful departments why we are failing to really scale up. So that's the first question. And probably the startups can bring that answer very successfully to us. It is not only ISRO to really think of R&D and also to productionize it. The privatization of space, the decision what has been taken could be one of the answer so that ISRO can focus on R&D and the industry can take over in the productionization and offering the services. Like GE and uh, Rolls-Royce have started sailing uh, their engines on the aircraft, not as an engine, but every hour you use their engine on your aircraft, you pay these companies. So I think that is the way the market is going to happen in space also. You are not going to buy a satellite, you are going to buy services. You are not going to buy a launch vehicle to launch your satellite, you are going to get a services. So somebody has to come. Now ISRO obviously cannot do this job. There has to be an agency which has to come to support ISRO. And I think that decision also has been taken. The Indian new space has been now incorporated who's going to do this privatization. So I think we are extremely on the right path. Now coming to startups, I'm just squeezing everything. I don't want to really take uh, time off for uh, Mr. Mark and we also need to close it down. I know everybody is uh, very eager to have their own other jobs, but come to the startups now. Just three years back, four years back, startup was something which is looked to be, oh, I mean, this is a crazy boy, not really uh, understanding what are all the difficulties, how it takes time to really develop. What happens in space is not overnight. It takes five years, 10 years. From that time today, we have more than 20 startups who are very actively working for Indian space program. Not only startups are there, we are having private equity uh, people who are ready to come and fund to these people to really take a real uh, good chance and uh, risk along with them. Government has made really good policies to support them. ISRO is really helping them, giving them opportunities to come, use their laboratories, use their test facilities, do all kinds of simulations, what a startup will find it uh, difficult to invest. And the most important is every IIT, every uh, regional engineering college, every small college in anything, you will see that there is an incubation center. For. It is getting encouraged. And all of this, the top of it is students are really getting encouraged. They are really coming. They are really finding it out 
a group of two or three and coming forward and using all these features which are being available i mean what more you can really see a vibrant india today than what is being there today and the space is going to be one of the greatest example unfortunately the covid has delayed the programs otherwise we were expecting that 2020 2021 would have been a complete rehaul of this entire the space system and we would have into a different world we don't have to really look for uh, the elon musk i think after 3 years 4 years he should really see and find out what mistakes he did that he didn't really copied what india did so that is what i am expecting on a very positive note i am very very ambitious i am really looking forward everything to be really changing in the next 2 to 3 years thank you thank you mr vaidya i i wish uh, zoom had an applause option and I, i'm really sure that all our viewers would be giving a standing ovation to this discussion and to the very inspiring note that you ended this discussion with i now open the forum uh, for questions we have some questions in the in the chat section and the q and a section uh uh we have a question for mark based on his presentation from rizwan that i saw uh, uh related to automate automatic purchases the supply point system report and update the inventory to erp and scp would you want to take this up mark yes yeah, certainly a, a short answer the answer is yes um but you know, connected to all the things that we've talked about today the digitalization having data being accurate uh, moving our systems and our factories to internet of things industry 4.0 connecting the data connecting systems so that the right information is in the right place to help all of us make informed decisions is really important so you know our equipment whether it's sap or it's any other erp system it can connect and take and move data around so that we're ending up with this position where we've got all the information in the right place which is what internet of things is all about it's actually having the internet connecting devices so that everything's available and we talked about sensors and all these things earlier on um those also can be connected in to give you the information about what's going on on your plant thank you now mahantesh and uh, and mr swaminath and both are asking uh, the same kind of the same question uh mahantesh has thanked us thank you to you also sorry manish bhatia manish bhatia has thanked us thank you thank you manish so this uh, the, these two questions pertain to the role of msmes role and uh, and, and scope for msmes sini would you want to take this up i'll read out the question uh, the future of msme in aerospace in post covid that is one question that i'll read out the other one also which is a similar question uh, what provisions are made for msme sector through aerospace and any incentive planned for aero components in near future like pli so so this is more of a government sector question see see what you want to address sini yeah the first one the participation of msme in the aerospace sector is i mean going to increase and i think there are a lot of opportunities that's going to come and the second one as okay. you rightly pointed out that's related to the government i mean i would leave that to the experts to answer i'm not an expert in that area okay okay <laughs> another question to you sini uh, when you think global investment in india defense will start without considering the offset clause it's uh, i mean already it's already happening you now you see the lockheed martin last year they started uh, their sourcing conference and a lot of opportunities are made available to the people and similarly hal is i mean a right, lot of business is coming from hal as opportunity to people so it's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing and it's already started it's nothing that you know it's going to it's a steady phase it's not that some it's, it's on defense it is not that you are going to see a sudden investment happening in a big way tomorrow it is not like that but it's happening steadily and uh, and hal they themselves are you know expanding their uh, opportunities so it will happen okay continue. okay i believe mr vaidya has got disconnected 
there's a question thank you manish for for your attendance uh, there's a question on ai i think that's for me yeah Do yeah me to, there's two there's two questions there are three questions one's on ai and artificial yes. intelligence and enabled internet of things and i think artificial intelligence um is a lot where when you're looking at iot artificial intelligence is a long way from that you know artificial intelligence is a bespoke highly technical complicated area one of the things that i would often refer to is more as business intelligence bi um, is what industry 4.0 and 5.0 and in internet of things can pull together and that's about having the the business information which is data coming together to drive business intelligent decisions you know all of us want to make the right decisions to help our businesses grow and be better and actually we all need the right information to have those to make those calls and so getting that information so i'd say it's more business intelligence it, it is enabled by iot um and um and i'd also say iot and 4.0 are pretty similar or are probably the same uh, in terms of the different different descriptions of the same thing the next question there, which is asking where, where can supply point systems be used in the aerospace industry? And I refer back to my, my slide, about the third one in, which talks about on the manufacturing shop floor, in tool shops, maintenance shop, anywhere where you want to control inventory stocks or assets, uh, things which need to be calibrated, things which need to be used on an aircraft engine or in a facility which have to come back at night, things which get booked out, come back. How do you digitalize that? We have systems to do that so it's not a piece of paper or in your head and it allows control and accountability uh, to ensure that factories run well run safely and we strive for those zero defects um, days that we, we always want to have so that's kind of how how we can play in this in this sector so i'll, I'll pass back to you thank you mark now we'll take up one last question this is about the cnc machining process uh, to protect your investment in aerospace manufacturing, how to improve your CNC machining process, increase productivity, improve documentation, increase quality and save time. Sini, you want to take this up? Yeah, definitely. It's about uh, reducing, I will just put it back, like, you know, using the CNC machining effect efficiently, kind of, you know, how do we do things faster? The speed, which matters there. And kind of an inspection, integrated inspection matters a lot along with the cnc machining so you know and a kind of a gang machining you know not uh, like not doing one by one that's very important and kind of uh, quick changeovers or integrated uh, uh, changeover possibilities are very important from the process design and uh, it's all very important for us finally you know we love to be to be cost effective it's a lot of it's just not the operation it's a right fantastic question it's a right thing to do on the drawing board on how do we do the CNC program to improve the productivity or better, how do we beat the best? That's very, very important. And at the same time, how do we ensure zero defect is continuously maintained based on the history? It, this is very important. And that's where one of our project is we are using technology to learn from the best and do it faster. It's, it's very important. Thanks, Saini. Thank you, Saini. There's a question for supply point. Do you want to take this up online or will you take it up? Um, I can take that offline. That's about tool life and how that we can manage cutting tools for the CNC process. And just to connect from the previous question and answer, you know, having CNC machines, you know, the machines are really important. The control of the cutting tools and the spindles is critical. And actually collecting information about how much of a cutting tool is utilized, um, when it was issued, how many each machine is using, again, can provide your business intelligence to help you choose what is the right product, the right operator, the right machine, the right temperatures. And so, um, yes, uh, Manesh, um, I think I'll have Rizwan reach out to you in terms of kind of um, talking about that, that question. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to you, gentlemen. Uh, thank, thanks to Mr. Vaidya, who's got disconnected. Uh, thank you to you viewers for your immense patience. You've been a wonderful audience. And we've had wonderful discussion today. Thank you, to you gentlemen. Good afternoon to you and good morning to you again, Mark. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, your time. It's been a pleasure.
Thank you, Mr. Vaidya. Good to have you back. You're just rounding. Yes, Sini, you're saying something? Thank you, everyone, and good luck. Thank you, Sini. Thank you, Mr. Vaidya. We are rounding up the discussion. Yeah. It, was, it was an honor. Yeah, sorry. I mean, there was a certain power failure. It's raining very heavily here in Mumbai. Yes. So I had to yes, yes, do yes. all my corrections. Restarting took some time. Not at all. Not at all, sir. So your views um, added immense value, tremendous value to the discussion. Thank you once again, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, gentlemen. My co panelist also. I mean, I enjoyed and learned a lot. Thank you. Mm, I did too. Likewise. Thank you. Have a brilliant day. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.